All right, well, uh, thank you all for, for coming tonight. Um, obviously, this is just kind of a, a quick intro. I'm not going to go into the whole uh, shark ecology SSI uh, homework, but really just kind of give you a, a taste of, of what these uh, ecology classes are like. Uh, so a couple of things, I'm just going to one briefly will, uh, introduce who I am, kind of what it is that I do and why I'm teaching these courses. Uh, and then, like I said, just kind of give a, a brief intro and kind of hopefully get you interested in what these these classes will be. And I can, at the end of this, talk a little bit more about what are all of the SSI ecology pages and then what else that W Diving, Diving kind of has uh, in store for us in the next couple weeks and months. Uh, so my name is Stephanie. Um, I am a biology professor with Texas Tech University. I've been teaching in wait on the Waco Extension campus uh, since 2014. Oh my God, it's six years. Can't believe that already. Um, so I'm primarily an invertebrate ecologist, studied out studying insects. Um, but anything creepy crawly, I love. And so when I go diving, for me, it's all about the little, the little things. I love looking at the corals and looking in crevices and looking in all the little sponges for, for the brittle stars and all that fun stuff. I think everybody kind of oozes and ahs over the, the fish and the sharks. And then I, I have to admit that I, I do have a lot of pictures of, of fish. Um, <laughs> but really, I love all the little stuff that most people just kind of uh, glance over. Unfortunately, SSI um, doesn't have an invertebrate ecology class, but when they do, I'm totally ready uh, <laughs> for that. Uh, so, kind of what else that I do marine wise. Um, I was asked to be part of um, what's called what we basically started calling our TIDES program. Uh, TIDES is, stands for Texas Integrated Diving and Ecological Studies. And you can see um, we basically go down to Roatan uh, usually every May uh, for the past, I think, 10 years they've been doing it. I've been a part of it for five years. Uh, we take about 25 students. The students actually all design their own research projects. Um, and it's just a really great opportunity. It's a study abroad class. We've had students, um, we go to several different conferences across Texas. Uh, we've had several students over the past couple of years win uh, best conference poster. We had a couple other students win best presentation, um, best marine poster. And we actually had our first research manuscript accepted in 2018. And we're actually working on another one right now. And this is all at the undergraduate level, um, which is just really a great opportunity uh, for the students. And it's a combined class. So we take students from the community college as well as Texas Tech and we go down together and kind of, this is our group from last year. And again, just really great that these, these students and they all get certified through WW Diving. So again, another kind of great opportunity there. So what is the SSI Shark Ecology Program? Um, they have seven, seven different chapters. Uh, you can see I have them listed here. Uh, the reason why they're in white and gray is I'm just gonna briefly talk about the ones I have kind of there in white. Uh, the gray ones I'll save for where we actually go over kind of the, the class as a whole. Um, but you can see it starts off kind of talking about our interaction with sharks. Why are we drawn to them? Kind of what are, you know, how do we take advantage of them? Uh, things like that. And then it starts going into basically the evolution of them. Uh, when did we start kind of seeing them diversify uh, in the geologic time scale? Um, basically sharks or fish kind of going into their anatomy and classification and all kind of the, the neat anatomical fe features about fish. Uh, making more sharks, uh, obviously as it sounds, goes into the reproduction of sharks. Uh, kind of looking at different egg cases and stuff like that. Uh, senses of sharks, as it kind of is implied, uh, looking at how they sense prey, um, how do they get through the marine environment. Uh, even finally, we can see sharks in the ecosystem. And I briefly want to mention that, what is the importance of sharks? What is it they actually do other than giving us something to look at when we go on a coral reef? But what do they do in the environment, right? So what's, what's their importance? And then finally, um, 
the homework starts going into what they call the bizarre, the awesome, and the beautiful. And it just, this last section is just going into a bunch of different select sharks uh, and kind of going over some really cool things. And so I kind of picked to end today, instead of giving you a laundry list of, of 20 different sharks, uh, I just kind of picked one common one to talk about today and then one really cool one um, that is listed in the homework just to kind of illustrate what it is that they're talking about in, in these ecology classes. <clears throat> so as I said, sharks and humans, what is our interaction with them? Um, I would say we have sensationalized sharks, right? Everyone is either in awe of them or terrified of them. Um, unfortunately, I think that goes back to the novel that was written in Jaws and then ultimately the movie. Uh, I think the author now actually resents actually writing that book, um, but it was sens uh, sensationalized, right? We now have Shark Week on Discovery Channel. You could probably sit there 24 hours a day for seven days and just watch shark, shark episode after shark episode. And some of them are really cool. Um, I do have to say I watched one on Great Whites um, that was simply amazing, talking about how they can identify uh, the sharks based on different scars that they have, and that was that was pretty cool. Don't forget the shark natos. The shark, you know, I I've missed the shark natos. I I have to say. <laughs> um, so as far as as shark bites and attacks, um, I did go back and try to do some research. Uh, there's a couple numbers that are listed in the SSI homework, and I would say and I, I tell this to my classes as I'm lecturing, numbers are arbitrary. Um, anytime you look at 10 different resources, you're probably gonna get 10 different numbers. Now, hopefully they're relatively close, but um, you know, so this number is slightly different from what's in the homework, but like I said, it's, it's relatively close. Um, if we go all the way back to the 1500s, um, about 600 bytes. Um, that is nothing. I probably got more mosquito bites outside today um, <laughs> than there were shark attacks since the 1500s. Um, of the 150 fatalities, primarily comes from these three shark species, right? And when we look at the first two, um, you know, kind of go figure, right? They're, they're pretty aggressive, especially a tiger shark. Um, what I found pretty interesting, and this, this graphic here is in, in the homework, um, look at what number one is, right? Anyone want to take a gander as to what that is? A mosquito. Yeah, mosquito. Um, millions of people are infected with malaria, dengue, West Nile, Zika, um, any of the Japanese Western equine encephalitis, right? Um, I, I also teach a, a medical entomology class over the summer where I spend an entire week going over fly diseases. Um, I think cows even have more fatalities per year than sharks, right? So, but I mean, you, you don't see cow natos, right? Um, <laughs> I haven't seen that movie yet. Ooh, although in Twister, there was a cow in the, in the tornado, come to think of it. <laughs> um, so another way we've kind of exploited uh, sharks. Um, unfortunately, when, when we start thinking about shark finning, um, we generally tend to, at least I do, tend to think of these as, as things that occur overseas, right? We would never do the, these things here in the United States. Um, however, at least this year already, and I kind of uh, included a picture here, um, I saw one news report, and you can see this one uh, was in Miami, but I think I saw another one that was coming through Houston where they also seized a whole bunch of shark fins. Um, there is a, a movie, um, if you're interested in, in this kind of topic, called Racing Extinction. Um, it's a really well done movie. Obviously, it's primarily about extinction, but it's, it's kind of talking about the, the wet markets and the, the trade and how we are just exploiting um, these animals and kind of if you, they had pictures of these rooftops that were just absolutely covered with these fins. 
And if you, you look at this and you, you calculate uh, the numbers of, of organisms we're pulling from the ocean is just crazy. The numbers, right? We are just overfishing uh, these, these animals to pretty much nothing. And it's, it's quite sad. Um, the other unfortunate sad thing of this is a shark weighs quite a bit, right? Um, and for shark fin soup is what you're seeing here. The body of the organism does these um, restaurant folks no good. So unfortunately what they do is they will chop the fins off and just throw the rest of the body over overboard. The unfortunate thing is they don't even take the time to kill the, the poor animal. Um, and so these will just go to the, <clears throat> the bottom of the, of the floor and just basically rest there until they die. Um, this, this whole thing is, is absolutely horrible. To make matters worse, um, and I just kind of put some numbers over here to the side, depending on the species, these, the, the amount, the value of these, these fins also goes up. The more rare a species is, the more endangered a species uh, is, the more protected a, a uh, shark is, the more money it will fetch, right? And so just for estimate, you know, it's, it could be $10 for one of these fins at some common, you know, reef shark. However, whale sharks, right, can go up to almost $20,000 for, for a fin to make soup. So it can be ridiculously expensive. Um, again, this is just one of those things, at least for me, just breaks my heart um, when I see this. So what is the purpose of a shark, right? What is it they do? Um, they serve lots of different roles, right? Um, I put here diverse ecosystems. Obviously, the first thing we think of when we think of sharks, we think of them being very aggressive, right? They like to eat lots of other fish, um, seals, anything pretty much. Now, we do not taste good, so we're not something that they, they seek out. Uh, they may take a bite, and realize quickly that we don't taste good and so they'll they'll go on um, but we're in their environment right and so sometimes shark attacks do happen you know it is what it is um scavengers right if an organism dies right if a giant whale dies in the ocean where does it go well eventually it's gonna you know first it's gonna float for a period of time and what a better resource for a carnivore than a giant buffet of whale just, just floating there for these organisms, right? And so they will come up and just scavenge on those organisms and remove that food from the, from the web. And that's just a really great source for them. Um, and then we have a lot of sharks that are not aggressive, right? So you guys know whale sharks, uh, basking sharks, right? These guys are filter feeders. They will basically just open their mouths and just fill up with krill and plankton and everything else in the ocean environment. Um, again, they are really important as, as, um, as part of the ecosystem. Uh, they fill all sorts of wide niches, right? And so this first one, the diverse ecosystems, that's kind of looking at, at what these organisms do from a, a feeding strategy, right? But then we can look to different types of environments. They, they go through all sorts of different depths. There's some that pretty much live in little tide pools. You know, a lot of them are on the, on the coral reefs, all the way down to 9,000 feet, right? Super deep waters. Now, most sharks are probably tropical and subtropical organisms where it's a little bit more warmer environments. However, they do go down to very extreme depths. Um, there are very old sharks. Um, you have some, the Greenland shark is, is estimated that there are some individuals, individuals that live up to 500 years old. Um, obviously, that's a very important organism um, in that ecosystem. And if we start overfishing these, right, if we, if we start removing these sharks from the environment, whatever it is that they feed on, their populations are going to increase. Right, and so if we have something like a grouper or something else, some other kind of mid-sized organism, it's gonna, if its population starts increasing, it's gonna start overfeeding and reduce the populations of those smaller fish, right? And if we start removing some of the algal vores, right, maybe we'll start having algal blooms on the coral reef 
and algae on your coral is not good either. Those corals are not gonna be able to get the sunlight they need. They're not gonna be able to photosynthesize. And basically that cascade effect, right, where things just kind of start falling apart, your ecosystem is out of whack. Um, you start seeing increase in some populations and decrease in other populations. And that's why we do um, our research studies. Um, I had a group a couple of years ago, and a group that was supposed to do some research this year that was assessing fish diversity. Um, are the fish that we are seeing the right fish? Um, are we seeing the right gills, i.e. feeding strategies? Um, are they represented well on, on those environments? The really cool thing about Roatan and where you know, we go with WW Diving is Roatan is a protected marine park, right? And so you're not supposed to be uh, fishing in those, those areas. And it is monitored. Um, the really cool thing is we went to Honduras, I think six, or excuse me, we went to Utila six years ago, and it was a very different environment. Um, one thing I noticed when we got there, the, the sponges were beautiful, but there wasn't that much uh, in, the, in the terms of, of fish diversity because it's not managed like, the, like Roatan is. And so even though the islands are only separated by a couple miles, right, and it's similar, similar corals and habitat, you can really see the importance of these fish and what happens when we remove these fish uh, from those environments. And so it's really important to, to manage and have an understanding of, of what is in our, our environment and really try to keep that as, as natural as, as can be. So just to kind of go over some of the, like, a, like I said, some of the different sharks, um, there's, I think, probably about 10, 15 common sharks that they talk about uh, in this ecology class, and then probably another 10 uh, sharks that they talk about. They're kind of bizarre. And so I just kind of picked out two uh, that I thought were pretty cool. Uh, so as far as common reef sharks, uh, probably most of you have seen these. This is the nerf shark. Uh, the reason why I picked this one is I just have this uh, experience drilled into my head when we were in Utila. And again, Utila for me was the, the first place I had been diving. And so I was diving with my students and we were doing our research and all of a sudden this nurse shark, and we were kind of forewarned that there would probably be nurse, shark, nurse sharks at this dive. And so I was sitting there working with this group of students and I'm looking at her and I see this shark coming in um under her and i was like oh this is gonna be fun <laughs> um and and sure enough she was looking down and all of a sudden this shark nurse shark comes right under her and I, all i see is bubbles going everywhere um and so i just i have that that experience and so it's something that just it's a it's a shark species that's important to me um so if we kind of look through the descriptions here right kind of has this brownish little coloration you can see those rounded dorsal fins. Um, it also has an elongate caudal fin. So this kind of long one here. Some interesting facts. Um, they're actually negatively buoyant. And so when you see these sharks kind of resting on the bottom here, that's, that's their buoyancy. Um, they don't have to fight anything. They can sink down. They can lay on the, on the sand there. They can kind of get into a little crevice. Um, and they're perfectly comfortable in those environments. Uh, you can see these two little barbels uh, on the front, kind of to me makes them look like a little catfish. Um, they, I, um, I think these are, they're pretty cool organisms. Um, yeah, I could have picked great white and tiger sharks. And you know, if we, when we have more time in the, the full uh, lecture, we can cover a lot more different ones. But like I said, just for kind of purposes of today, just kind of wanted to pick one common one, and then kind of pick one that was a little bit more unique. Um, pick one shark that probably most people have experienced, and then one shark probably most people have not experienced. So this one is called the epaulette shark. Uh, the reason why it's called epaulette is it has these kind of large brown spots. You can see it right here in this little gif on the bottom kind of on their, what they say is kind of the equivalent looking on their shoulder, those kind of large spots. Uh, they're about three feet, so not very big. 
um, as far as sharks are concerned. Uh, these are primarily found in Australia and New Guinea. The really cool thing about this shark, and you can see it in this picture here, is they will walk. Um, they will get up into those shallow tidal pools. They'll stay on the coral reef. They'll go down to about 50 feet in depth is probably about their, their deepest. But what they really like is they really like to be up on the coral reef, uh, kind of in that branched acropora coral, um, or in these little tidal pools. And in the tidal pools, you can see they will actually get up on those front pectoral fins and basically move about. And so what's really cool about this is when you think about fish and kind of, at least for me, from a biologist perspective, when you start thinking about, you know, the transition from those marine environments to these kind of terrestrial environments, this is a really great example of that kind of in-between organism, right? It is, it's a marine organism that is kind of, I'm not saying it's transitioning to a terrestrial environment, but it definitely is taking advantage of that, right? Which a lot of other sharks do not. Um, because they're up in this terrestrial environment, they do some other things that are quite unique. Um, they can survive with no oxygen. These guys don't have lungs, they have gills. Um, again, they, they can kind of shut down their brain for a period of time. Um, and this is what allows them to stay in that terrestrial environment. And to me, this is just the coolest little shark. Um, so with that, um, I think that kind of concludes just to kind of a little preview as to what the SSI Shark Ecology Program is all about. Uh, like I said, they, they do go a little bit more in depth into the evolution and kind of the relationship between shark skates and rays. Uh, go a little bit more into the anatomy and what makes a shark different from the bony fish. Uh, then I said like going into the physiology kind of component of the shark and what makes them really great predators um, kind of as an organism is changing all these depths, right? We, you know, as most of us are divers, changing depth rapidly is not a good thing. Um, and so the sharks do have some, some, uh, anatomical differences that make them able to to make those depth changes pretty rapidly um, and like I said with the, the the full version of the shark ecology one we can go into more so more uh, cool little sharks out there so that's kind of what the the shark ecology one is all about um, I would further add that there are six uh, ecology classes in total you have Marine ecology, the manta ray, which one just came out, ooh, uh, what, Rebecca, a month or two ago, if that. Um, sea turtle, shark. To me, I really like these four. I think they're really awesome. The coral and the fish identification ones, uh, these are really good as well. Um, there's just a little bit that I wish SSI had, had changed. Uh, Re Rebecca can kind of attest to that. Um, I tried to provide them some suggestions um, and a little bit of corrections to some of this. Uh, not that it's wrong, it's just... Uh, not quite right. Not quite right, thank you. <laughs> um, with that, um, I wanted to kind of give Ed an opportunity to kind of talk about what else uh, WW Diving is, is kind of got in store. Ed? Okay. For those that don't know me, my, my name is Ed Guinea. I am WW Diving's newest open water instructor. Rebecca and Steve got me over the hurdle last fall. Uh, so I've been charged with two more of the classes that SSI is offering that don't require any in-water activity. Uh, you can do them essentially totally online. Uh, one of them does have one specific requirement that means you do need to drop by the shop, but uh, they can essentially all be both be done online. The first one is called Science of Diving. If you go back to your open water class, you were exposed to things like how pressure changes with depth and uh, how water changes the appearance and size of objects in the water, how sound and temperature are affected by water. Uh, this one part of the science of diving 
goes into more of the theory behind that. And yes, there's some equations and some math involved, but then it also starts covering things like physiology, you know, the circulation system, how important it is and what happens as you dive. Uh, it goes into decompression theory, how it was developed and how it's important to us as divers. Uh, it talks also about uh, <clears throat> ecology, or excuse me, animals in the environment, aquatic animals, as well as, uh, I already mentioned decompression. Those are the kind of things. It takes what you learned in open water and, and lets it go deeper, learn more of the theory rather than just the subject. Uh, the second class is one that most divers will eventually want to take uh, if you do any amount of diving in the Caribbean, Atlantic, Pacific, wherever. And that's your enriched air nitrox course. Uh, they are offering a version of the full-blown course that gets you to what's called 32% nitrox. <clears throat> it was a total online course. Uh, as I said, the only requirement is you do have to come into the shop quickly to show that you know how to analyze a tank. Otherwise, it's all online. Uh, including the test, just as the science of diving is. So both of those we are offering uh, and schedule will depend on how much interest we get. Uh, anything so, else, that, Rebecca? Ed, didn't we, uh, on, our, on our last trip, didn't every, every single diver you dive nitrox? Yeah, if you do liveaboards, they're gonna want you to dive nitrox. Uh, primarily because that keeps everybody on the same profile. Uh, if they've got one diver on air and everyone else on nitrox after two or three days, that one guy on air doesn't have a lot of bottom time left. So that's why they, they push it. And I think on our last trip, there was one person who was not certified. Uh, they became certified on the trip just to make life easier for everybody. So that's the two courses. Rebecca wanted us to mention, uh, again, just like the ecology courses, talk to Rebecca, she can get you signed up. And then once we see what the interest is, uh, we'll schedule those classes and they'll be, like I said, all online, your own homework. And then we can do a quick Zoom session to fill in the blanks. Is Anything the shop else, Rebecca? Gonna, is the shop gonna be open? Uh, yes, I'm going to be at the store tomorrow from 12 to 4, Friday from 12 to 4, and I think Monday back regular hours. I'm going to stop recording real quick.